couple of announcements very quickly. The men's Bible study meets tomorrow at 9 o'clock and continues its series looking at First and Second Peter in the New Testament. The women's Bible study is in recess for the month of September, but starts a new series on the 2nd of October. Uh, ladies, a good opportunity to get that advance date in your calendars. Uh, you'll be very welcome any Wednesday to the Women's Bible Study. There is information in the bulletin uh, about the new program. Then a word of thanks to those of you who turned up on Tuesday last to pack seeds uh, for Hope Seeds. They're going to Haiti to help agricultural workers there to establish uh, good crops, healthy crops, life-sustaining food for the community. And then lastly, just a note to remind those of you who contribute to what, for the next six, eight months, will be our monthly newsletter, Grapevine, that the deadline for articles for the October issue is Tuesday of this coming week. The other announcements are as listed in the bulletin, and as always, we commend them to you. Let's now take just a moment or two of silence to reflect on the privilege that is ours of coming into the presence of God in fellowship with one another to offer our worship and our praise. A brief time of silence for personal reflection, private prayer, and then the service begins with the prelude. Friends, together, let us worship God. Please stand and join me for the call to worship. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving.
Please be seated. And together, let us make confession to God as we join together and say, God and Father of all, you call the church to be the body of Christ, Christ's presence in the world, his mission to the world. Forgive us for the ways we miss that calling. We are too much like ourselves and too little like Christ. We are eager to be self-starters instead of spirit-led. We value conformity and resist diversity, even though Christ's body is diverse. By your Spirit, lead us to be a true example of Christ's body in the world, loving, open, active in the service of our Lord and Master, using the gifts he gives us by his Spirit. We ask it in his name. Amen. Friends, Christ is our peace. In him, the grace of God embraces us. Gladly, we affirm the truth our faith proclaims. God offers full forgiveness through Jesus Christ, our Lord. <clears throat> chapter 12, verses 12 through 20. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink from one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. Amen.
And now we bring our prayers of thanksgiving to God. Most gracious, most loving, most generous God, comfort, strength, encouragement, love, and trust. These are your gifts to us. Thanks and praise are our response, not in some empty way, but in truth, in reality, in response to you here in our hearts as we offer you our worship. You came to your world in Jesus Christ, our Lord, walking in places no one would dare to go, Embracing those considered unlovely. Encouraging those with no sense of worth. Strengthening those who lacked courage. Forgiving those who lacked peace. As you embrace us in your inclusive, unconditional love, we thank you for that holy ground on which we are privileged to stand. You come to us in grace, through Jesus risen and exalted, accepting us as your people, calming our fears, calling us to grow in Christ, strengthening us for the opportunities of the life of faith. Thank you for your grace, for your loving acceptance, for your bracing and embracing challenge. Help us to use your gifts in your service, steadying those who stumble, encouraging those who are weary, comforting those who are lost and welcoming them home strengthening those who face tough times and feel hard knocks, living in such a way that develops a sense of trust and confidence among those who feel that faith is empty and so ignore its meaning. Lord, we bring before you the worldwide church and all who work in service of your kingdom. Be near to all who seek to live by faith, especially in the difficult places and the discouraging situations. Be with all who, in obedience to Jesus, seek to be peacemakers and peace bringers. Bring peace, loving God, we pray 
Peace that calms the struggle of suffering. Peace that injects joy and meaning to an empty life. Peace that overcomes the anger that disrupts relationships. Peace that touches the burdened hearts of national leaders. Peace that grows from the creation of a fairer world for all. And, dear God, bring peace to our hearts that flows from faith and hope and love, your gifts of mercy, grace, and love to us who seek to follow Jesus in and through his church on earth. We pray in Jesus' name and in his words, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we bring our offerings for God's work in the world. Bless, we pray, our giving, loving God, as we ask you also to bless our living, that in word and in deed we may show the world that we are yours and share your mission to bring others to know your love, your mercy, and your grace. We pray for your love's sake. Amen. We continue reading from 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 27. 
having set out a kind of parable uh, of the church as a human body, Paul now underscores the meaning of that parable. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then deeds of power, then gifts of healing, forms of assistance, forms of leadership, various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? But strive for the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 12, Paul applies the meaning of his little parable. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. 
A few years ago, Duke University's Will Willimon was speaking at a clergy conference in Hawaii on a pre-conference sightseeing tour. His guide enthused about wonderful Hawaii. It's a tropical paradise, he said, where all the ethnic groups live in love and harmony. Looking around him, Willimon said that he could quite believe it. He was impressed. Then he met the clergy. <laughs> Harmony? They complained of disjointed congregations where the Japanese think they're better than the Koreans, and the Koreans look down on the Samoans, and everyone detests the Japanese as much as they despise the Anglos. And high rates of drug abuse and shocking poverty. Welcome to the church, not just in Hawaii, but also in Corinth. Corinth was slightly different, but just the same. Different in that apparently they managed the major social divides between Jew and Gentile, rich and poor, slaves and freemen, without too much difficulty. But they couldn't cope with the spiritual distinctions. Some were particularly gifted, others were blessed with ordinary, everyday faith. And that was the problem Paul tackled in chapter 12 of his letter. It was a mess. The high flyers looked down on those with lesser gifts and wished they weren't there. Maybe they should take themselves off and form the first Corinthian church of no hopers. Or perhaps it was the other way around. Perhaps the underachievers wanted to slink off to a fellowship of the least demanding discipleship, where they would not be troubled by spiritual overachievers. Either way, Paul said it was a huge mistake. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You're included. You belong together as you belong to Christ. You're like a human body, two eyes and one mouth, some organs you don't see, some organs you may not even know you have, but all are needed and all together make up one body. Now, of course, diversity in the church can be untidy. People can see things differently. Some love organs, others want guitars. Some want the narthex full of lively chatter and warm welcome. Others want to come in and go out in reverent silence. Some value a church that is open to the community. Some want the church to be members only. Wherever there is church, there are some people who want whatever, and some people who want the opposite. And we need to face the truth that this is not an accident, that God wants us to understand that we need the inconvenient other opinion to help us take our blinders off and consider other possibilities, perhaps even to face the crushing realization that we might not always be right. It's like 
in human families. Sometimes when family disagreements are handled carefully, they may be inconvenient, but they can also open our eyes to aspects we hadn't considered. Last Sunday, I mentioned Dean Nelson's wonderful book, God Hides in Plain Sight, How to See the Sacred in a Chaotic World. And like everyone else's, Nelson's world is sometimes chaotic. He gives this instant. When our daughter was six, someone had recommended that she attend a modeling agency's call for talent. She had Shirley Temple hair and a Disney voice. We didn't see the harm in her trying out. In fact, I hoped that modeling might be the means for paying her college tuition down the road. And things went well. The modeling agency was interested. But Vanessa's 10-year-old brother grew more and more upset as the process continued. One day he burst into tears. Don't you see what's happening? He pleaded softly. Nelson said, I had no idea what he was talking about. If you already think people pay too much attention to their bodies, their hair, and their clothes, what do you think this is going to do to Vanessa? He could hardly speak for how hard he was crying. Nelson continues, I just stared at him. He was absolutely right. He was speaking the truth clearly. He was warning us of trouble ahead if we pursued this idea. He was so right. Darn him. You disagree with me? Darn you. Especially if you might be right. And I think that one of the things Christians need today is the humility to enter that mindset, to be open to the truth hidden in the inconvenient thought. That disagreeable person who's disagreeable because they disagree with us. Back in 1960, the liberal leading Christian Century magazine invited seriously evangelical leading Billy Graham to contribute an article to their series, What Ten Years Have Taught Me. With equal broad mindedness, Graham agreed. And in the article, he wrote, In groups which, in my ignorant piousness, I formerly frowned upon, and that may be an understatement, in groups which, in my ignorant piousness, I formerly frowned upon, I have found people so dedicated to Christ and so in love with the truth that I felt unworthy to be in their presence. That's Billy Graham writing. He goes on, although Christians do not always agree, what is most needed in the church today is for us to show an unbelieving world that we love one another. And despite being criticized by fellow believers on the right, and fellow believers on the left, Graham modeled an openness and inclusiveness born of humility in a way that we could all learn from today. 
The German theologian and preacher Helmut Tillichy was for a number of years a stern critic of Billy Graham until one time he was invited to sit on the platform with Graham and he watched him operate and he heard him preaching and he became an admirer. On another occasion, Tillichy once said, God not only has regular troops who are loyal to him, but also guerrillas. Regular troops, guerrilla forces, different people, different perspectives, different gifts. Doesn't matter. You belong together. And that is the point of Paul's little parable showing the absurdity of the foot or the ear issuing a declaration of independence. You are connected to one another and together make up one body, Gaius and Crispus and Stephanus and all the rest of you are the church. No, that's not quite right. All of you together are Christ's church. Christ calls us, Christ owns us, Christ gives us our place, then gives us things to do and gifts with which to do them. Where do you think Paul got this insight? Where do you think he learned this truth? I'll tell you, he learned it from Jesus. Have you ever noticed how broad-minded Jesus was? Or come to that, how broad-minded Jesus is? He called Peter, brash, bumbling, speak first, think later, Peter. He called John, deep, reflective, thoughtful John. He loved Martha, rattling pots in the kitchen. He loved Mary, sitting at his feet, drinking in his every word. The great 19th century preacher Joseph Parker was once asked why Jesus chose Judas to be one of his apostles. Parker replied, Sir, I do not know, but I will show you a greater mystery still. I cannot make out why God should have chosen me. Christ chose, Christ calls, Christ leads. Now you are the body of Christ, Paul says. It's his church, and you're included. You belong, all of you. A few years ago, the philosopher Nicholas Wolterstoff gave a public lecture in Regent College in Vancouver. The night, he felt, was a great success. His audience was very enthusiastic. The question and answer session which followed his lecture was terrific. People really engaged with what he'd been saying, and he left on a little academic high. On his way back to his lodgings, he and his wife stopped off for a nightcap. And at the bar, a lady told them that she had been at the lecture and asked if she could join them to discuss it. Walter Stoff's account goes on, anticipating that she wanted to tell me how wonderful she had found the lecture and to pose some questions that had occurred to her, I said, of course, please join us. So they began with small talk. Apparently the lady, having become a Christian, had a long and difficult journey before she found a community of faith that suited her. Then, down to business. Here's Walter Storff's account. Then she said, I must tell you 
how repulsive I found your lecture. The Christian gospel is simple. You made it complicated. A slap in my self-satisfied face, Walterstoff realized. He went on, I agree, I agree that it's simple, but it's also rich. I was trying to present some of the richness. But why did you make it so complicated? It's simple. I agree it's simple, but it's not only simple. Beneath the simplicity, there are depths and riches. I was exploring some of these. But why did you make it so complicated? It's simple. I wasn't making it complicated. I was exploring some of the depth and richness of the gospel. Then why did you make it so complicated? I did not make it complicated. You did. And then Walterstorff says, I lost my cool. We are leaving. There is no point in talking with you. You just keep saying the same thing over and over. You don't listen to anything I say. He got up. And he was halfway to the exit when he began to feel terribly guilty. He spun round, returned to the booth where the lady was still sitting, embraced her awkwardly, and said, You are my sister in Christ, but I'm not going to talk with you anymore. <laughs> he left as he put it, with his wife in tow. So, who was right? Both of them. Who was wrong? Both of them. Paul, in Ephesians 3 verse 9, has a phrase that I absolutely love and find inspiring of all that I seek to do as a minister. Paul talks about the unsearchable riches of Christ. And as Christ's body, we have eyes and ears, a mouth and hands, and Christ needs all the parts to explore His truth, to expound His truth, and in the world to embody His truth, you included. Let us pray. Lord, your church is indeed a great mystery, a diverse amalgamation of different people with different backgrounds, different races, different viewpoints, different ambitions. And yet it is your church. And you mold us together to be your body in the world, your mission to the world. Keep us firmly in the place that you have given us and help us grow in ways that strengthen your body and advance your kingdom. We pray for your love's sake. Amen.
and God is there. Wherever we go and whomever we encounter, God is there in grace, in mercy, and in love, seeking to use us as his people. So go to live the life of faith and be blessed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, this day and always. Amen. Thank you.